Okay, I think we can get started, guys. I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, joining our uh, humble RV Nug meetup today. Uh, we continue to have online meetups until we return back to physical presence. And uh, we already have our location, and it's just a matter of uh, uh, getting through this, these times and get back to physical presence. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but until that day, we continue to bring you guys great presentations and speakers, and today is no exception. We have a fantastic presentation lined up for you by Jesse Liberty. Advanced Data Binding in Xamarin Forms. Jesse Liberty is a Microsoft MVP and a Xamarin MVP. He is the author of best-selling books, including Programming C Sharp by O'Reilly and two dozen other books. And he has created courses for Pluralsight, LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, and Pact. He is a Xamarin certified mobile developer and he hosts popular yet another podcast. He was a senior evangelist for Microsoft, distinguished software engineer at at and software architect for PPS, and Vice President of Information Technology at Citibank. Jesse can be followed on Twitter at Jesse Liberty. Thank you, Jesse, for presenting here tonight. Take it away. Thank you. This course may be uh, relatively short, but it's also going to be relatively intense. I'm assuming that you already know Xamarin Forms, and uh, not assuming that you know data binding, although that's helpful, and certainly C sharp. All the examples will be in Xamarin Forms and C sharp. So let's start at the very beginning. What and why data binding? Uh, in the good old days or the bad old days, if you had data and a way to display that data, it was your responsibility as the programmer to copy that data into a form that it could be displayed. And then if the data changed, you would have Just to by saying, hand go and I, update I, that display. If I can interrupt you one second, uh, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with um, uh, Xamarin, um, the um, Xamarin forms. If you want to do like a really small spiel on what that is before we get started, it might be helpful for some of some of us. Sure, uh, Xamarin forms is a framework from Microsoft uh, that allows you to build multi-platform applications, uh, native applications. Uh, the primary use until recently of Xamarin forms was to build iOS and Android applications. Xamarin Forms allows you to do that with a single code base and it creates native code in both platforms. Uh, that's the essence of, of, of uh, Xamarin. You create, uh, you can in theory create all of your application in C Sharp. What is much more common is to do the UI in XAML, X -A -M -L, which is an XML derived uh, design language. So if you have a, a button, you would describe that in XAML, and then you would have the uh, the work that's done by that button, such as a, com a click command or whatever, you would do that in C-sharp. There's a paradigm in working with Xamarin Forms called MVVM. This is you know far more than we want to get into today, but the, the essence of it is model, view, view model, where model holds your data, the view is your pages, and the view model has your uh, intelligence, your business logic and so forth. So data binding uh, says that um, if I have data, rather than having to copy it from the data source into the display element, I can bind those two together. And then as the data changes, the display will update automatically. And you can actually have that be two way. So if somebody is filling in a form or choosing from a selection, you can have that go back and update your data. Was that was that what you were looking for, or did you want to go into more detail? No, that's that's great. I, I think uh, that that's great. Is it is it similar to WPF? I know uh, some of us here are familiar with WPF, or is it completely different from how WPF works? No, it's uh, it, it is much like WPF for developing mobile applications. Uh, you can also now with Xamarin you can develop Mac OS applications, uh, Apple uh, Watch applications, and stay tuned for lots of new stuff coming with what's called Maui. MAUI, which is the successor to Xamarin Forms, which will be out, last I heard, will be out this coming spring. Oh, yeah, I've been hearing a lot about Maui, like every every turn. And um, I see they're going to, I thought they weren't going to include it in six, uh, I thought it was just going to be a seventh thing, but now I hear it's actually going to be included in the production bits in the later releases of six. So that's awesome. Yeah, Maui got pushed back. Um, the idea of Maui is that if you're a Xamarin Forms programmer, you're pretty much a Maui programmer. Um, obviously, there's more to learn, but but it's uh, very backwards compatible. 
And the hope is that there'll be a utility to transform your Xamarin Forms application into a Maui application. But we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves because that's, you know, four to six months out. Uh, so the data binding uh, that you're showing today would be applicable for Maui applications? 100%. Oh, fantastic. So uh, as I said, uh, this allows you to tie your data and your uh, display. And we're going to look at what that means. So let's say we start with a um, uh, property called welcome text. Now, what you're looking at is a pretty standard way to create a property in Xamarin. You have a backing variable here called underbar welcome text, and uh, that would be private. And you can initialize it. So we've initialized it to welcome to basic data bindings. And then you have a getter and a setter. And uh, there are a lot of ways to write the getter and setter. But essentially, the idea of the getter is when you say uh, that you want whatever's in welcome text, you use the getter. And when you want to set the value of welcome text, you use the setter. And what I've shown here is a sort of a simplified, stripped down way of doing it. Um, now, what I can do is I can create a label. And I can set attributes of that label, like its font size and so forth. But most important is I can say that I want its text, that is what the label is displaying, to bind to that property, welcome text. And so whatever welcome text says will now be shown here. So if we don't change it, it'll say, welcome to basic data bindings. But we could use the setter to set a different string, and that will automatically be updated in our label. And that is, in a nutshell, the essence of data binding. So hold on, uh, strap yourself in, because as I said, this is an advanced uh, presentation. So the first thing we need to know is the binding context. And that tells the entire user interface where to get its data. And there are a number of ways to set your data context. One way that is uh, common is to do it in your XAML. And so you can see a little XAML snippet here that says that on our content page, which is essentially the, the page, uh, we're going to have a binding context. And that binding context is going to be in the namespace model and in the class bookstore. And we'll look at what that means. Um, the, uh, there are a number of ways to set the data context that get more advanced. In fact, we'll look at uh, one more advanced way of doing it. Uh, but the, the essence is that the data context tells the binding where to look. You can also bind to collections. And you know what? Rather than using the slides here, I'm going to switch out and use uh, code because I think it's a lot clearer in code. So we're going to go to here and open up this solution. All of this code is available on GitHub, and I can uh, send you the link to that. So here we have uh, a typical small Xamarin application. Um, let's open up the model. So in the model, we have two classes. Normally, you would put them in separate files, uh, but there's a certain amount that uh, uh, that simplification that makes it easier to do this presentation. Uh, the um, first class is called book. And you can imagine that a book has a name and an author. And of course, it might have a collection of authors. But again, we're trying to keep this simple. Um, and then we have a class called bookstore. And that bookstore has a number of properties, one of which is the store's name. Another is a list of book items called books. And then we're going to initialize uh, bookstore, that's this class, uh, by saying that the store name, remember this is the property store name, is equal to Jesse's books. And then we're going to make a list of books. Notice up here we have a list of book called books. Now we're going to make a temporary list called books in stock. And we fill that with three books. And each book has, as you remember, these two properties, name and author. So we're going to initialize that for each of the three books. And then we're going to set our outer books list to what we just built. So what we end up with is a collection of three books and a name inside an, uh, an object called bookstore. The next thing that uh, we're going to look at is how we're going to do the layout of displaying that. And again, this uh, assumes and assumed that you were comfortable with Xamarin and that we would be looking at it just the advanced data binding parts. I will try to fill in some on, uh, on the Xamarin pieces. So we go to the main page. This is sort of a typical main page. We're setting our binding context to that bookstore that we just looked at. And that means that when we're looking for the properties that we want to bind to, they will be in that bookstore. Next, we're going to create a stack layout to just hold everything, and then a label that has a hard-coded text, hello. And then our first binding, we have a label whose text is binding to the store name. Now, you'll remember in book.cs, we had a property called store name. And property 
in, in as far as Xamarin is concerned, is any uh, public value that has a getter and a setter. And here we're using automatic getters and setters, which is to say that instead of having a backing variable, uh, this is done for you by the compiler. OK, so that's uh, what we're binding the store name to. And then we want to create a list. Remember, we have more than one book. So we're going to create a list using the list view, which has a attribute called items source, which tells it where to get the uh, where the data is for this list view. And we're going to bind that item source to books. And you remember books is a collection of book items. The next thing we're going to do is tell the list view uh, that we're going to create an item template. Now, what that means is as we go through each item in the list, this is how I want you to display it. And so the list view is going to present each item in the list and present it and display it in the way you describe here. And what we're saying is we want to set the text to the author to the name of the book and then detail, which is um, text cell has two lines. One is the bigger line text and a smaller line detail. And so we're setting the detail to bind to the author. So what have we done? We've created a list and we've told it that its item source is the book's collection and that we should display for each book in the book's collection, we should display the name and the author. So we can run this, cross your fingers. I've had some trouble with iPhone today. We're in an iPhone simulator. That's not what we wanted. Ah, uh, yes, we've seen this. Um, I'm going to try to fix this very quickly, but if not, we won't run the, um, the examples. We'll just walk through them. But let me see if I can fix this very quickly. Uh, this is going to be, let's close Visual Studio and we'll open up uh, where this is, which is in source, repos, XF data binding. And we're going to look for all the OPJ fi um, fi folders, excuse me. And all I'm doing here is cleaning out as any C Sharp application might. And I'm cleaning out the uh, OBJ files, which will be recreated for me. So I'm going to mark all of those and delete them. This may or may not get us where we want. But if it does, it'll be easier to demonstrate. If not, uh, we could try Android. That might be an, a, another solution um, to not having iOS working appropriately. The way that uh, Xamarin does iOS is it is it connects. You have to have a Mac if you want to do iOS, and it connects remotely to that Mac, and then uh, uh, uses the Mac to build the iOS application and displays it on the Windows screen, which is very convenient. Uh, okay, that's all the OBJ files. Let's reopen Visual Studio. Uh, go back to our data binding solution. Visual Studio, wake up. OK, um, let's just do a quick clean to give us a good shot at this working. Where is build? It should be in this solution. All right, let's, uh, let's try it this way. OK, let me open the solution. And you'll notice uh, in just a moment that there is this little television looking thing. And that's how you pair up to the Mac. I think it's going to do it for me, but let's click on that. It's not, so I need to do this manually. I double click on the one of my Macs in the house, and it makes that connection from my Windows Visual Studio to my MacBook. And uh, it do you have to have something running on that MacBook Pro to allow no, you? No, you just have to have a MacBook or a Mac. Um, uh, there are things that it's going to want. It's not correct for me to so say you don't have to have anything. There are things that it's going to want that are already built in, like Xcode. Um, and uh, we can get into the details of what you have to do on the Mac. But, but the essence of it is you need to have a Mac um, ready for development. OK, so we're connected to the Mac. And we're going to try one more time with the uh, simulator. And if that doesn't work for us, we'll switch over to Android. And if that doesn't work, then I will just show you code without showing it running. Uh, not happy. OK. So let's uh, let's bail on iOS. I suspect we're going to have the same problem with Android uh, because once iOS is unhappy, Android tends to be unhappy. Let's set the um, where am I going to set the startup project? There we go. So Android is now our startup project. We've got an emulator for Pixel Five. Let's see if that will build. Here's our emulator. Nope, that's not going to build either because of the problem with this 
uh, folder. That's just fine. We're going to look at code and just not have it run. So what we would see if this were running is you would see a list of the books that are in the book collection. And each book would be displayed one by one. And what would be displayed would be the name and the author as it is described in this data template. So that is basic fundamental data binding. Uh, I would not consider that advanced. I would consider that just sort of the fundamentals of data binding that you would do in any Xamarin program. So let's move on to uh, something a little more interesting uh, for those of you who are already comfortable with uh, data binding. And that, let me blow this up for you, hopefully figuratively. OK, I'm going to have to keep switching. That's fine. Um, this is what we saw already in the code, uh, just calling it out that we have a label. And that label is binding to the store name. And the item source is binding to the books. And then in the data template, we're saying how to display. So we've seen this already, uh, just a quick review of that. And now we want to talk about paths. Paths can be somewhat confusing for folks because there are implicit and explicit paths. What a path says is that I want to get data from this place, from this data source, but I need to dive into a property of that property. So I need to tell you what I'm what I'm get where what I'm asking for, what my what property I'm asking for, and then I need a path to however I get to what I want from there. And I know what I just said is very confusing. So let's look at this example. We have uh, built into Xamarin a time picker, and we'll give it a name, time picker, and we'll set the time to uh, 5.05 p.m. Then we're going to take our label, and we're going to want to set the text. Now, remember that I had said earlier there are a number of ways of setting the binding source. One way is to do what we're doing here, which is to say that we're setting the binding source, the thing we're going to use to bind to, to that time picker itself. Now that we have the time picker, we want to set the text. And to do that, we want the seconds. So we're going to use path and set path to time dot total seconds. Remember that time is this property of the time picker. So we're saying go get that property time and from that get total seconds and then just print out however many total seconds there are. So let's again look at some code that might make that a little bit clearer. Uh, the best way to do this is to close and reopen, I'm afraid, because it gets confused by the solution. Okay, let's go to data binding. This is a very fast machine, but sometimes Visual Studio can take a little bit on its loading. Here we go. Okay, we want path. So here's our path demo. And uh, what's happening in our path demo, let's bring that up as a solution file. OK, uh, this one is a lot simpler in terms of the, the structure. Uh, we simply have a main page. We don't have any uh, model or view model. Uh, we just have our main page. And so I'm going to double click on that. And uh, you'll see, uh, let me walk you through this code. This is a typical heading. On a, XAM, on a XAML file. So it tells you the class that it's connected to, which in this case is main page. Uh, that's going to be the code behind. Now, what's code behind is for every XAML page that has markup, there's also a CS file that is associated with that file. It's called the code behind. It's very little in there, and there should be very little in there. Uh, basically, right now, all it's doing is initializing what's on main page. But you'll see that very frequently. Uh, so that's our class. And then we have namespaces. And not to worry about that, we can also give this a name. But we're going to start with a stack layout. And a stack layout simply puts one thing on top of another. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to balance uh, giving you enough basics in Xamarin uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Xamarin while continuing to look at the more advanced aspects of, um, of data binding. And that wine you here is my dog who wants attention. Uh, so we start with a time picker. We give that time picker a name and the time. And then we have a label. And as you remember, we set the binding source to the time picker itself, this time picker right up here. And we set the path to time.totalSeconds. Now, uh, there's a tool for Visual Studio called vSharper. And it's filling in these little helpers that says the name equal time picker, which is the name. And the path is time picker dot time. So that light gray, if you can see that, is just vSharper being helpful. But what we're actually asking for is time.totalSeconds and then printing that out. Now, another thing that we can do with data binding while we're here is we can bind to an object 
uh, on the page. That is to say, we can have one display element display a value from another display element. So a built-in element in Xamarin is a slider. And I'm sure you've seen sliders, uh, um, pretty straightforward. We're going to set the background color, and then we're going to set the maximum and minimum values and the current value. What we want is that as we slide the slider, we want this label to tell us what the current value is. And the way we're going to do that is to set the text equal to, and now we're going to set our binding source to the slider. So the slider is going to be where we get our data, and the path will be to the value. Sliders have a value, you can see it being set here to four, and as the slider, as you slide the slider, that value will change and will be reflected here. So that's pretty straightforward. You're just saying to the label, get your data from this slider and use path to go get the value out of it. The next thing that we're gonna look at on path is path as a content property. And you will note here that there is nothing that explicitly says path. This is, uh, again, this is B Sharper helping. But what we're actually saying is the text is binding directly to the value. And we can do that because the binding context has been set to the slider. Uh, so we say bind directly to the value and your source is the slider. And there's no explicit path here. Um, in this next example, we can say that we're going to set our binding context to the slider explicitly. And we're going to say we want our text to bind to the value. But notice that we're going directly to the value, not as we did here using a path through the slider. So there's a lot of built-in usage of path. And sometimes, but not often, you have to explicitly state the path. Um, so let's go on. Did, did you have, you know, interrupt me if you had uh, questions about what I'm saying. But not hearing any objections, I'll continue. What's the, what's the gray code? Um, <clears throat> The, I noticed like part of it is gray, like right there. Yeah, name equals. Right. This, what, this what, is all put in by ReSharper as helper information. Gotcha. So all you said was value, and uh, ReSharper is helping you, helping you understand where that value is coming from. That's correct. Gotcha. That's correct. Gotcha. And if you have, let's say you have a value true, uh, ReSharper will tell you what that true is connected to. So you, so when you're looking at code, you don't say, well, what what is this true? It'll say, you know, it'll say whatever the 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 variable or property. You've just set to true, so VSharp can be very helpful in that way. That's that's really nice. What's the design time experience here? Is it does it know the properties of the classes you're binding to? Like, if you, does it do IntelliSense and lets you pick the properties? Or yes, yes, absolutely. So you could say, for example, um, let's see if I can come up with one quickly. Uh, you can come down and say, I want a label, and I want to, uh, and it, it immediately tells you what what things you can set, what, what attributes you can set on that label. And it also tells you the two that it thinks are most likely that you're going to want to set. So I can choose text, for example. And then it sets up my text with double quotes. And I can say hello. And then hit space. And it says, OK, we suspect now that you want to set one of these four things. So I can say text color. And I can set that to, and it offers me the various colors. So yes, it's very helpful, IntelliSense. And uh, there's a new thing, uh, IntelliCode, which is astounding. Uh, let me see if I can show you that here. Um, if I say uh, int x equal foo, it immediately should, didn't. Uh, am I not in a method? Oh, I'm in Xamarin, excuse me. That's not going to work. If I go to the co uh, code behind where I'm in C sharp, if I say int x equals foo, then the IntelliCode is going to come back and say, I suspect you want to say int y equals, and I just hit tab. And then I can go on and put in another string. And it says, um, you know, here's its suggestion for what you might put there. But I'm just going to put in a uh, bar. Now, IntelliCode actually learns as you're coding. It learns um, your style. And so it'll start making better and better suggestions. But that's an aside from what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So let's go back uh, to here. And to, I think it'll be easier to see if I make these full size. OK, so that was path that we looked at. The next major piece, uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a, a review of what we just looked at, where the label's text is set to the binding source set to slider, and then the path set to value. That's the value of the slider. And uh, we, we looked at this in the code. This, this slide just reviews what we just saw. Now, converters. Converters are amazing. 
and a little bit hard to get your head around. Uh, the uh, a given use case, there are many, many, many use cases for converters, but the one we're going to look at is we want to know if there are any characters in the entry, if the, if the person has typed any characters in, then we want the button to become enabled. But if there are no characters, we want the button to become disabled. The way we do that is we have an is enabled property or attribute on the button. Now, is enabled is a Boolean. However, the number of characters is an int. And we want the Boolean to be going true if that number is greater than zero. You cannot use an integer directly on a Boolean. So we need to change that int into a Boolean. And the way we do that is we implement an interface called iValueConverter, which has two methods, convert and convert back. And let's go look at that in code because that is kind of cool. Um, I seem to have to close this to get that solution every time. So let's save that and open it again. It's got to be a better way, but we'll go with this for now. OK. Half a second to come up. Somebody has a better way to get through to get to continue to return to these projects. Please put it in chat. Um, OK, binding converter demo. Let's look at that. Probably these all should be projects on this solution. That's what would have helped. OK, our binding converter demo starts in the main page and says, I'm sorry, the uh, dog opened the door and we're getting a lot of noise. So let me close that. I'm sure many of you who've been working at home are familiar with this kind of issue. Uh, OK, so this is our main page. And uh, we're going to come back to the resource dictionary in a moment. In our stack layout, we have an entry, which is obviously for entering text. We give it a name, search entry. We put in a placeholder. And the placeholder comes up in gray text. And then as soon as you start typing, it disappears. I'm sure you've seen that in other applications. And notice that we set the text to an empty string for now. We also have a button. And the button says that it's going to be enabled by binding to, uh, the, to its source, which is the search entry, which is right here, search entry. So is enabled is bound to search entry. Now, remember that we said that you can't bind it directly. And so what we're going to do is get the text length using that path and then call a converter into bool. What is a converter into bool? Well, up here at the top, we have our resource dictionary. That's pretty common to have a resource dictionary at the top. And this is where we tell the uh, XAML where to get that converter into bool. And what we tell it is that using the local namespace, go find the into bool converter. And I'm going to give you a short name key int to bool. And that's what we use down here. So what's in the into bool converter? Well, we come up to our converters folder and we find into bool converter. Look in there, and it's really very straightforward. We're going to implement the iValue converter uh, interface. And that requires two methods, convert and convert back. Convert takes four uh, parameters. The first is the value, whatever you're going to pass in. And in our case, that's going to be an integer. The second is the target type. And then we have uh, parameter and cultural information. What we care about at the moment is the value that's being passed in, because this is a very simple uh, converter. So what might be, and notice that's an object. So what might be passed in is um, three for three characters. And what we're going to do is cast that value to an integer and check to see if it's equal or not equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, we're going to return true. If it is zero, we're going to return false. And so notice what we've actually done, therefore, is we've taken this integer value and converted it into a Boolean. Now, because of the interface, that is going to be returned as an object. You'll notice in main page that is enabled, is able to take that because the real value of, of what we're getting back from the converter is a Boolean. Have I lost you? Uh, let me go back to the converter. It's common, <clears throat> although not consistent, but it's common to have just a convert and not have a convert back. Now, the interface says you must, so often you'll just throw a not implemented exception. But there are places where convert back can be very valuable. For example, if we pass in a Boolean value, then we can have it return uh, one or zero, depending on whether that value is true or false. 
So what this say is saying is convert the bool, which is an object here, convert the value into a boolean. And if it's true, return one, otherwise return zero. So converters can be a very powerful way to work with data binding to convert from one type to another, but there are also all sorts of converters uh, usable in Xamarin form binding. Uh, this is really a kind of simplified example to get the sense of what the converter can do. Keep wanting to open up Chrome. Okay, so what do we have? This is converters. Let me blow this up so we can see it, but I believe this is just review. Uh, card slide. Okay, so this shows our interval converter, and this shows the convert back, which we looked at in the code. Remember that the way we described to the Xamarin to the XAML that there was a converter was by referring to it inside a resource dictionary. Local will be a namespace, and then interval converter is the name of the actual converter, and then the key is how you're going to refer to it in code. So we have an entry whose name is search entry, and we have a button, and it's in, is enabled is tied to that search entry. It's bound with the path being text length, so how how many characters are in there. And then we call our converter, and notice we use that key into bool, which we defined up here, which refers to our into bool converter, which was the code we just looked at for the converter. Okay, nulls or fallback. Now we're getting into some really advanced uh, data binding now. Um, we don't have much more, but, but I do want to show you some uh, advanced topics. So let's just, with this one, go directly to the code, nulls or fallback. Um, yeah, it really would have been better had I made those projects under the solution because now we have to close this. Let me see if I can close the solution instead of shutting down and then go back here. Will that work? And that will work. That's wonderful. Okay, null or fallback. Let's open this solution. And null or fallback has a model folder, a view model folder, and then its main page. So let's look at what's in each of these. Inside the model is a person object, and a person has a name and an age, and notice that the age is nullable. So we don't guarantee that we have the information as to this any individual person's age. Then we have a student. The student derives from person, so it has all the same properties, but adds a property called school name. In the view model, we're going to create the data for school and what we're going to do is create a list of person objects called people, which is a property as a getter and a setter. And then we're going to create a property school. And what we're going to do in there, we've seen something very much like this before, is we're going to create a temporary list of person objects, initialize our person objects. So we have a new person, name and age, another new person. Then we have a student, which is fine, because you'll remember that student derives from person. So a student is a person and therefore can be in a list of person. And that student is going to have name, age, and school name. And then we have a second student. And now we're going to set this temporary list to our property people. And I've put all of this in a try catch block just to ensure that we're going to get um, safe additions here and not throw, if we throw an exception, that we're going to know that and be able to put a breakpoint there. Let's look at mainpage.xaml. OK. What we do have here is we start with a stack layout. Everything in the Xamarin needs to be in some kind of container, uh, either a stack layout or a grid. So I've been using just a simple stack layout. And now we have a list view. And what we're going to tell that list view has uneven rows equal true. That means that not every row will be the same size. And you can see why we would do that because a person has two properties and a student has three. Then we're going to set the items source, which is where the list view gets its data, to bind to the people list. and that. It's very common, a list view binds its items source to a collection. Now we want to tell the list view how to display each object in that list. So to do that, we create a view cell. And inside that view cell, we're going to create a grid. And that grid says that we're going to have four rows and they're all going to be auto, which means they're all going to take up as much space as they need. And we're going to set a margin of five all around. Then inside that grid, we're going to have labels. The first label is at grid row zero, and its text is going to bind to the name. The second one is at grid row one, and it's going to bind to the age, but 
What if age is null? Well, if age is null, we're going to use this attribute, target null value, and set that to the string age unknown. That avoids crashing when you have a null value here and gives you a uh, value to display even if this age is null. Similarly, on row two, we're going to bind to the school name. But if we don't have a school name, then we are going to use the fallback value attribute, which says if you don't have one of these, then use the string no school found. We're then going to create a box view uh, at row three, which is just to say, you know, it has a height of one. So basically it becomes a line between each of these. And I very much wish that I could show that to you running. But uh, what you get is a list with name, age, and school name for each of the people we have. And where we don't have an age, you get age unknown. And where we don't have a school name, we get no school found. This is the one you get if age is null. And this is the one you get if school name is empty. Do we have any questions about that? Because that, that's pretty um, advanced and, and there's a lot going on here. OK, I'll go on. I believe we're coming in on our last topic. Could be wrong. Unless we just hit our last topic. No, we haven't. Uh, I know that from current slide. Come on. Trust me, I want you to run. Well, that's interesting. Let's try this. OK. And then go to slideshow and say from current slide. There we go. Display settings. OK. We did nulls and feedback. The next thing I want to talk about is one of the most confusing things that you'll see in data binding. Uh, it turns out not to be very complex and to be pretty straightforward. But when you first see it, it's very confusing. It's binding, the word binding, followed by a period. It's often called binding dot. This is the result we're going to get by using binding dot. But let's look at the code of how to use that. So first, we'll look at a relatively simple example. Let's close this solution. And go to the binding dot demo. And we'll open up that solution. And notice that uh, each of these has an uh, iOS and an Android solution. And that's where you would put platform specific uh, custom controls if you were writing your own controls. But things like label and, and uh, stack layout and time picker and so on are controls that are provided directly from Xamarin. And you don't have to do anything in Android or iOS. They will uh, emit the, net, the correct code to have a native label, a native uh, each of the uh, um, elements. What we're doing here is we're setting a stack layout, and then we're setting a frame, which just gives you uh, what look like cards. Uh, we're setting the background color of that, padding, which is much like margin, except instead of between things around the object, it's the, a small distance within the object to keep your uh, pieces, uh, the aspects of the element separate. And we're setting a corner radius of 0 on this frame, which is going to give us a squared off frame. Now, the very first thing we see is this label says its text is binding dot. And what that means is that it's going to bind to the entire object. Now, what we want to see is in here, I believe. Oh, uh, OK, give me a second. While I try to find what I'm looking for. OK, let's go back to the main page, and we'll just go from there. OK, the easiest way to see this is in this second stack layout. Here, we're using the value date time now. Date time is an object in uh, C sharp, and now gives you the current instant. We're now going to, and notice that we've set the binding context to that, to that date time now. So we're not saying we're not binding to a set of data or to a list. We're binding to the now property of a date time object. So our first label wants to show the year. So it says binding, and then year. So we're binding to the year. And we're saying the year is such and such. And then we do the same thing with the uh, binding to the uh, month. Um, it's a little, here's a place where uh, B Sharper is not helping us tremendously. Um, but the piece that we care about is here, this line, whoops, that line, because what this says is binding dot. And what that means is I want to bind not to a property of the date time now, but I want to bind to the whole thing. 
That's what the dot means. I want to bind to my entire binding context. That allows me to get the full date right out of the now because I've bound my text, my label, to date time now. Now, instead of using binding dot, you can just use the, the word binding and close the brace, but it's, uh, it's not exactly the same. And one reason is that it doesn't work and play well with uh, other text. And notice we want to be able to say the day is or the time is or the full date is, and, and that's hard to do with binding without the dot. So the most common thing that people do is binding dot when they want to access the entire context. So let's take a slightly more complex example. Uh, binding dot, just in case you felt like you were beginning to understand. Let's see if we can't throw you off a little bit. And we're going to open up the example of using binding dot with a list. Binding dot list view, come on, you can open, there you go. Exclusion. Okay. This one comes right out of the out of the box application that has an about page and an item detail page and items page. And this is right out of your basic uh, uh, there goes the brain <laughs> it, it, it's the out of the box mobile application is what I'm trying to say so we're going to go to the about page and take over and what we're going to do on the about page is we're going to set the binding context to classroom and notice the VM namespace which tells us that it's in the view models so let's go over to view model and what we're looking for is the classroom which is right here Okay, we've seen something like this before. Classroom has a name of the class, and then it has an observable collection of student called students. Let's look at what a student is. We'll come back to that observable collection. Student is a very simple class that simply has a name. An observable collection, unlike a list, says anytime anything is added to this collection or removed from this collection, notify the display. And so we're going to have an observable collection of student we just looked at what the student object is called students, and that's a property now on this classroom object. In the constructor to the classroom, we're going to call create students. And in create students, we're going to make a new observable collection called kids. And in that, we're going to create new students. And then as we've done before, we'll set the property students to the temporary observable collection we just created. So the net of this is that this class has an observable collection filled with students called students. Now I'll go back to our display. And I believe that that is all the slides I have, but let me take a quick look. I just opened the wrong thing. Uh, this is what the output would have looked like with binding dot. It tells you the year, the month, the day, and this is our binding dot for the full uh, date time. And then this is binding without the dot. Uh, if you go to jliberty.me slash advanced with a capital A, D, B, zero, that will take you to the first uh, in a series of advanced data binding blog entries that will go over this very same material. You can also get all of the code on GitHub at XAMESP slash XF data binding. And uh, we can take a quick look at that, I believe. Let me, uh, let me bring that up for you. Well, first thing to do is bring this where you can see it. So if we go to this address, github.com slash XAMESP, and you can see data binding is already there because I've been there before. You'll come to this page, which is where all of the source code is 
for the items that I demonstrated and will also be here for all of the blog posts that are coming. If you go to the uh, address, you know, when you use dark mode, it's very hard to tell which is what. Uh, come along. Not what I wanted. What I want is this address, jliberty.me advanced db0. So if we go back to the browser and we go to jliberty.me advanced db0, and that will take you to my blog post, uh, starting at what we called part zero, the basics. And this tells you how to bind to a property, reviews, binding context, binding modes, which is like one way or two way, how collections work with binding and so forth. Um, that was supposed to be an introduction to uh, data binding. And at the end of each of the data binding, you'll find um, the uh, others in the series as a link and often more about the topic from Microsoft as a link and a link to the source code. Let's, uh, let's go to the uh, first one, data binding one. That was data binding zero, more of an introduction. And here uh, you'll see that we talk about paths just as we did earlier. And you'll find that um, each of these blog posts talks about the things that we talked about tonight only in more detail. And fortunately it has uh, screen captures because at one time in history, my uh, compiler did work. So you can work your way through. I think we have four of these. We'll be adding more uh, that have topics on advanced data binding. Hopefully you will also, uh, while you're here, take a look at yet another podcast, uh, which is our podcast that talks about all things Xamarin and C Sharp. And that's what I've got. How do I get back to seeing you? Let's see. I've lost you. You are still there, though, right? We are here. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a meet, Google Meet sometimes hides your presentation window or the meeting window. <laughs> yeah, that must be what it is. Let me see oh, if I can, can find you. Uh, well, I'll just work my way through. This is astounding. You have disappeared. <laughs> uh, probably for the web browser pages. It just embeds it in a web browser. Yes, I'm, I'm, I've gone through all my web browsers. Ah, there you are. I found you. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much, Jesse, for showing off the advanced data binding and Xamarin forms. Um, I love how the data binding eliminates uh, a lot of the boilerplate that you would otherwise have to write, you know, loading and reading your UI, yeah. you know, pages. It's, I mean, it's, it's so much boilerplate. You would you have to constantly write. And this, you create your classes, and the view, the UI, just that's it. That's all you got to do. You just set properties and it just loads. You, know, you, right. you say, right. take this display element, bind it to this property, and it just works. That's and awesome. What we looked at today is more advanced topics, but you can work with essentially with basic data binding for a long time before you need any of these advanced topics. That is great. Now, I'm also really excited about uh, uh, using this stuff in .NET MAUI applications and run them on Windows uh, and my Windows and Mac machines and along with my phone and still have the ability and watch. to- yeah, oh, on my watch, right? Yeah, yep. And uh, still have the ability to compile this and uh, give it to Drew to uh, run it on his Linux machines too. So <laughs> right. that is right. awesome. That's um, you know, it's gonna enable all of that. And um, this this stuff is pretty pretty darn cool. What was the GitHub address again? The GitHub address. Let me bring that up for you. I think it was like GitHub.com/slash/zam. Yes, capital X A M capital E S P slash capital X, capital F, capital D, and then that's data, capital B binding. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'll try to follow back Drew on writing like UI applications for Linux. And there was like, I don't know, I was limited at that time. How was the landscape nowadays? Is it still, you know, challenging to write um, applications in Linux? I have never done that. I live in terminal land. <laughs> okay. Um, if I was going to try to do it, I'd probably try to use Qt. Yeah. Because yeah. I only know C plus plus, so yeah. Well, I, I think this will. I mean, this this technology enables a you know super easy and very good looking UIs on you know, all the platforms, and it's going to be supported under Linux, which is uh, I'm looking forward to that. You know, write it once and be able to run it under all these platforms. Yes, definitely very cool. Very well. Cool. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me and for sitting through. Uh, a presentation that was supposed to run and, and we didn't have the compiler working, but I think we got through the code uh, without it. 
and uh, I'm hoping it was valuable. This was uh, fantastic. Um, let's see. Um, so next month, um, do you like Visual Studio Code? Do you like Docker? Well, come check us out uh, first Thursday of April, which is going to be April 7th, and see Sydney Andrews present on how you can improve your .NET developer workflow with Docker and Visual Studio Code. So that's going to be a really good presentation. Everybody, I think, nowadays likes Docker and Visual Studio Code, and using that for development, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a great presentation, and Sydney is a great presenter as well. So appreciate you, Jesse. Thank you so much for uh, presenting for us, and uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Have everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse.